Colonel Orville Hughes, United States Army, Korea. I interviewed Orville Hughes on March 8, 2007 in Abingdon, Maryland. He was 85 years old at the time. Today he's still alive, folks, at 101, and he's still going strong. Great story about the Korean War. Orville served in World War II, was injured, became a prisoner of war, went on to fight in the Korean War, and was a tank commander of the 179th Infantry Regiment, which was part of the 45th Infantry Division in Korea. Tells a wonderful story, and I'm glad that you're here today to see it on Voice of History. Brandon Glidden, again, thank you, sir, for sponsoring this interview, making it possible for others to hear and to see Orville's amazing story. Folks, if you'd like to sponsor a story, I'd encourage you to think about it, do so if you've been watching these videos for a while. And uh, there's information in the video description and in the comment section if you'd like to donate to my work. Or you can go to LarryCapetto.com where there's a lot of information there too. So, Okay, let's keep this thing going, folks. Subscribe to this channel, share this video with somebody else. By the way, Orville Hughes was a Purple Heart recipient and also he received the Silver Star for his valor in the military. He's 26 years in the military, just a great man. Like I said, he's still alive and kicking and God bless him. Thank you for watching and I'll talk to you again. I'm 85. So back in Korea, 1953 is when you were, were you during, in the whole Korean War? No, I, uh, I got to Korea in uh, uh, early 1953, in fact, in January. Uh, I was en route in late uh, 1952, arrived in the country uh, January 1953 and was assigned to the 45th Division. Uh, that was an infantry division. Captain? I was a captain, yes. So you were in charge of how, about how many men were under you then? Well, about 130 men uh, constituted a tank company, and uh, it has 17 tanks. Okay, so that's quite a bit of responsibility. It is. Can you tell me a little bit about the Chinese as far as an enemy? Uh, obviously, I'm assuming you're fighting the Chinese. Well, we were fighting uh, alternately the Chinese and the North Koreans. Uh, the Chinese had entered the war uh, when the, the war had uh, progressed uh, to the uh, Yellow River some uh, two years before, and it was at that point that the Chinese entered the fray and pushed uh, the uh, U.S. forces back to uh, the area of the 38th parallel. Uh, during the, that period, then, the, uh, the war was more or less stabilized, uh, and uh, the lines... Uh, ultimately uh, were about the same uh, f from the armistice period until the present day. Now, what uh, exactly was your responsibility in Korea at the time that you were there? I was uh, assigned to a uh, regimental tank company of the uh, 179th Infantry Regiment. Uh, a tank company assigned to a regiment usually uh, has then uh, a tank platoon, which consists of five tanks, in support of uh, each battalion. And uh, the regiment fights as a regiment. But uh, in those days, we were up on the, the line, and the line was pretty stable. That is to say, we were not advancing or retreating. Were you at the 38th parallel? Well, it, the 38th parallel, as you may remember from your history, was the, uh, the demarcation line after World War II. And the area above that was under Soviet influence, and the area below was under uh, the influence of the South Koreans and, uh, and U.S. forces, or uh, I should say United Nations forces. Uh, as a result of the fighting, uh, where the armistice ended up was uh, a, uh, a line 
that in some areas extended above the 38th parallel, and in some areas it was below the 38th parallel. Just give me just a brief history of Korea, why we were there. We were, we were there um, because uh, we had fought the Japanese. And uh, late in the war, the, uh, the Soviet army uh, came into uh, the war for the primary purpose of uh, establishing a sphere of influence in, uh, on the Korean Peninsula. Uh, the United States, of course, saw a possibility of uh, establishing at least part of Korea as a democratic uh, government, and uh, so that uh, the, the Cold War uh, extended right into the Pacific area. Uh, a vacuum was created when the Japanese uh, were defeated, and uh, that left the Korean Peninsula uh, in limbo, and uh, the, the Soviets saw an opportunity for them to establish uh, a sphere of influence for communism, whereas uh, our sphere of influence below, and it, that was part of the negotiations ending the war with Japan, was to establish a demarcation line uh, at the 38th parallel. I'm going to jump ahead with a question. This sure. is usually towards the end, but why do you think Korea is referred to as the Forgotten War? Well, it was, in fact, forgotten uh, at the time that hostilities began uh, on June the 25th, uh, 1950, and uh, continued then for, uh, for three years. It was forgotten because I think American people and the media uh, quickly forgot that uh, there, there was a conflict there. Perhaps it was the fact that uh, World War II had only ended in 1945, and uh, five years later, uh, we're suddenly uh, involved in a conflict which uh, was under the name of the United Nations. We had, in the meantime, uh, come into the United Nations and felt uh, compelled to support it. So we fought there as a member of the United Nations rather than as the United States alone. And it was forgotten because the American people perhaps had, uh, had felt that they had enough of war. I think we, we felt uh, with the defeat of Nazi Germany and uh, Japan that we would have a very long period of peace. And unfortunately, five years later, we found ourselves again at war. It's amazing how many people know nothing about Korea. I mean, it, and that's part of the reason I'm wanting to produce this documentary about Korea because I've learned so much stuff, even though my father was involved in the Korean War. But uh, tell me about the uh, engagements you had with the enemy in Korea as a tank commander and, and where you were and what happened. The, uh, by the time I got there, the, the line had stabilized, as I had indicated. Uh, it extended partly above the 38th parallel and partly below. Um, the, the forces on both the north and the south were dug in, entrenched, uh, and uh, not able to move. Uh, in the context of the use of tanks, tanks are weapons of mobility. Uh, they, of course, uh, do have considerable firepower, uh, but tanks in the, this phase of the war uh, were not used in a, in a mobile role. Uh, they were used on the line, dug in, uh, right on the main line of resistance uh, and firing at the enemy. So they were, they were not used so much in an offensive role, but in a defensive role. Uh, we, uh, we, we sat there sending out patrols, that is the infantry units would send out patrols mostly at night to probe the enemy positions and the enemy would do the same. Uh, we need to remember that during this time, armistice negotiations were going on and had been going on for nearly two years. But uh, in the meantime, uh, both sides were trying to gain an advantage in case uh, an armistice agreement would uh, occur that uh, uh, it was to the advantage of one side or the other to gain the most geographic area uh, before the war ended. 
So again, the combat, the, the Chinese, the North Koreans, tell me about what you're doing as a tank commander, what, you, what, what your men are doing. All right. Uh, as a company commander, uh, uh, when the 179th Infantry Regiment was online, I would, uh, it would usually have two battalions online. The principle of engagement in the, in the military forces is that you usually have two-thirds of your strength engaged with the enemy at any one time, and you, you retain one-third in reserve. Uh, that is to say, one-third of your forces are resting while two-thirds are engaging the enemy. In the tank uh, unit, we practice the same uh, uh, tactics when we had two battalions online, I would have two uh, tank, up, uh, tank platoons in support of those battalions, and I would have one in reserve back with the com uh, company uh, command post, which would be behind the, uh, the, the fighting area. And the Chinese at this time, I mean, are they coming in waves? Are they like that I hear stories of? The, the Chinese uh, were... Uh, a little bit to the would be the west of uh, of our positions. Uh, the 45th Division had a tank battalion in addition to three tank companies. Elements of the tank battalion were in support of a uh, Republic of Korea division, which was adjacent to us on the left. They were faced with the Chinese. We were faced with the North Koreans. And while I was there, the Chinese did mount a major offensive, which did involve many of our 245th uh, tank battalion uh, tanks. And the, ta the uh, Chinese at that time penetrated several miles be be uh, before the line could be uh, reestablished. Uh, it was a major offensive in the early 19. Uh, uh, 53. Were you, was cold a factor for you at that time during the winter? Uh, the, uh, the climate in, in Korea is not a whole lot different than it is uh, in Maryland. Now I, I say in Korea, in the part that we uh, were in, in uh, the, the area of North Korea, up near the Yalu River, uh, the the, the climate there is very, very cold, and uh, you probably remember the, uh, the offensive that occurred when the uh, UN forces uh, were on the offensive and pushed the uh, North Koreans back to the Yellow River. And that winter, uh, there was a, it was a brutally cold weather. Uh, that's not to say that it was uh, really mild in uh, the area of, of Korea that I served in, but it was not bitterly cold either. What about your, your casualties and losing men? I mean, I'm assuming that happened, and how did you feel as a commander of a unit when that did happen? Uh, the, during static warfare, your, your principal casualties will come from artillery fire uh, or from uh, patrols that are sent out to... Uh, probe the enemy's positions. So the casualties that uh, we experienced in, in that particular time was mainly in the infantry. And they were not great, and uh, they were usually from small arms fire. I should mention that uh, in, in explaining the configuration of uh, the front lines in, in static warfare, that both sides are dug in deeply. All along the front, uh, bulldozer had, had created uh, trenches, roads behind the front lines. Uh, you have to remember that there were mountain ranges in that area, and the enemy was on one mountain range ahead of us, while we were on a parallel mountain range uh, just to the south of them. Usually there was low ground in the, in the middle, and uh, so that any contact would take place in that so-called no man's land. It became really an artillery war and tank war with one each side uh, shooting back and forth. The men lived in bunkers. These were, uh, these were dugouts 
in which the sides and, and roof were made with uh, logs, uh, tar paper over the logs, and then uh, sandbags over those so that they were protected from anything but a direct artillery hit. And that's where the men slept, and that's where they ate when they were not manning their, their weapons. So that the, even the infantry units on the front line would, uh, would be monitoring their weapons and their positions around the clock, but they would spell each other off so that part of them would be getting sleep and part of them would be on the alert. And uh, the, the tank units did the same. They would always have somebody uh, manning the tank gun uh, around the clock. And the others then would be in their bunker uh, getting rest. What kind of tanks are you talking about? The American tanks, were they Shermans? They were. Uh, during World War II, the, the Sherman uh, mounted a, uh, a 75 millimeter gun. Uh, but after the war, uh, the Sherman was improved and uh, the gun was extended. Uh, there was a different model of the, uh, of the Sherman tank and it was a more powerful gun. It was still a uh, 75 millimeter, but it was a longer, more powerful rifle and uh, had a greater range than the one that uh, was uh, used in uh, World War II. And the, the Chinese or the North Koreans, what kind of tanks did they have? Russian By tanks? and large, they didn't use tanks no. because uh, uh, during the time that I was there, uh, there was no movement of, uh, of the major forces. It was not what you would call ideal tank country. Even uh, during, the, uh, during, during the offensive in uh, the late 1950s, when uh, U UN forces moved to the Yalu River, of course, we did use tanks. Uh, when the North Koreans launched their offensive into South Korea in uh, June 1950, they had Russian tanks, but, uh, and those Russian tanks uh, enjoyed considerable success during their offensive, but uh, their tanks were mostly uh, destroyed in the offensive that uh, moved to the Yellow River, and tanks then never became a critical force uh, after that. So again, 1953, you're, you're engaged in combat in Korea. Uh, you, are you pushing them back, or what's, what's the goal? No, actually we're not. And uh, the, uh, the strategy at that time, uh, all along the line, was containment, just to make sure that they did not uh, mount a surprise attack. And uh, the feeling was that the diplomats were working toward an armistice agreement and uh, that armistice agreement, uh, as I had pointed out earlier, had been going on for nearly two years. Uh, and uh, the, the promise of an armistice agreement uh, led to the philosophy, I think, on the part of, uh, of the high command uh, not to expend lives to, uh, to capture additional territory uh, and the resulting casualties, uh, because if we came to an agreement on an armistice that uh, uh, we would be able to extricate ourselves from Korea, and that is what happened, as you know. Uh, we still do not have a peace agreement in Korea. We are still in the same posture with an armistice as we were in uh, July 1953. Uh, do you feel there was a strong sense of purpose of, for being in Korea? Like a lot of the Vietnam veterans, I think they might have lost sight of what they were there for because of the country and all the politics. But do you feel in Korea you guys had a strong sense of purpose of, of what you were doing and why you were doing it? I do, uh, because uh, we have to remember that the North Koreans uh, were the ones who launched the attack in the first place. Uh, we didn't even have when I say we, I mean the United States, did not have a significant presence in South Korea uh, in uh, June 1950. Uh, we rushed a few troops from Japan, 
uh, when the invasion began, and then uh, we had to react and call up forces in the United States to get over and protect the Pusan perimeter. Otherwise, the North Koreans came very close to completely overrunning South Korea. We, uh, we knew that North Korea was being turned into a communist uh, state, and uh, the United States was following the same policy then as it followed in uh, Korea, in uh, Vietnam, it was to block the spread of, of communism in Asia. Now, what was the official date of the ending, if we're going to call the ending of the war, the armistice, or July? It was July, I believe, uh, 27th, they stick out in my mind, but it was very, very close to uh, three years and one month. It was in July 1953. I was up on the front lines the night that the armistice uh, took effect. The, uh, the terms of the armistice was that at uh, 2,200 hours, uh, both uh, those sides would stop firing. And it was a very, very strange experience because, strangely enough, uh, it seemed apparent uh, that night that both sides were uh, shooting up all their ammunition so they wouldn't have to move it. Uh, the terms of the armistice, as the frontline soldier knew it, was that we would have to pull back about 10 miles. Both sides would pull back 10 miles and then establish a temporary line. And uh, there had been a lot of uh, ammunition uh, stored in forward positions so that uh, it was uh, 4th of July multiplied a hundredfold uh, that... Uh, uh, artillery and, and tanks and uh, uh, weapons on both sides uh, were firing madly the last uh, two or three hours. And precisely at 10 o'clock at night, it became deathly still, something I never will forget. You always wonder when you're in the military service, is, uh, did the other side get the word? It's very strange because you know, it's a matter of communications, but uh, when that occurred, it became deathly still. And perhaps for three or four minutes, no one moved. Everybody had been in their bunkers to protect themselves from artillery fire. And then people began to come out. We looked across the way, and you could see people coming out, lighting up cigarettes, flashlights. And you very very seldom ever saw the enemy during daylight hours, and of course you couldn't see them at night because they were they were entrenched to a greater degree than we were. We could see their trenches, but they didn't move during the daytime. But they they came out at night, and we didn't go over and shake hands or anything like that. But uh, uh, it it did indicate that uh, their communications uh, system was as effective as ours. And uh, there was not a shot fired after that time. So it's not like uh, traditional well, traditional warfare where you fight to the end, the last guy's no. shot. I mean, the, the politics got involved to where somebody else decided we're going to call a peace treaty or whatever, and then they found out about it, you found out about it. How, I mean, how did they communicate that? Through the radio, basically? Well, it came down to through the chain of command uh, from our side, and I'm sure it did on their side too. I guess we uh, never give uh, an enemy such as the uh, Chinese and North Koreans with credit for having uh, the kind of effective communications that, that we have because of our technology as general, in general is more advanced than theirs, but uh, still the, uh, the, the word did come down, we knew that uh, that an armistice agreement had been reached, and we knew that we were to stop all uh, offensive fire uh, precisely at, at 10 o'clock, and uh, that the next day we would begin to pull back. Uh, but we, of course, did not uh, have total trust in the other side, so that uh, we didn't simply uh, retreat back to... to uh, uh, training areas, we established another defensive line for a period of time to see 
if this armistice was going to hold. And, but hold it did. And of course that area now where Panmunjom uh, is the, the meeting place uh, still has the same uh, demilitarized zone that was created by our pullback and by their pullback. It's a no man's land even today. It's interesting listening to you talk about how it was just firing and then it stopped. It's like, it like the end of a 4th of July display, you know. It was. All over? It was. And uh, was there like an excitement, for lack of better words, uh, leading up to this possible armistice? I mean, with, among the troops, was there an excitement or an excitement? Well, there, well, there was uh, because uh, the, uh, the, the average soldier uh, was not sure whether this would move up his rotation date but uh, he knew that, that it was a positive development if the uh, shooting stopped. Uh, I think after, after the shooting had stopped, we all thought what a shame it would, would have been for, tho for those who were uh, wounded or killed during that last couple of hours uh, when we knew the armistice was going to take effect and there were uh, people killed. Uh, and I think at one point it was, at least it was publicized, the, the last soldier on the U.S. side that was killed uh, prior to the armistice taking effect. And that was in your area probably? It was, it was not, it was not to my knowledge. Uh, and to my knowledge, uh, uh, we, didn't, we didn't have anybody in the regiment uh, wounded or, or killed that night. Uh, but uh, that was only because our defensive positions were so well constructed that uh, we were, they were very well protected. And it, you know, it would have been a tragedy for anyone to get killed when they knew the armistice was going to take effect. Or what, what should people remember about Korea? I mean, all these years later, what, what, what do you think people should remember about the Korean War? Well, I, I think that uh, the Korean War is another example that uh, we successfully resisted the spread of communism. Uh, the, the Korean War well, when I say the Korean War, I should revert and say that the North Koreans, of course, uh, if anything, continued on their uh, political uh, objective of creating a communist society, uh, and we did successfully resist the spread of communism. And I think in retrospect, what has happened in South Korea is truly a miraculous development, uh, not only of the uh, progress of a democratic movement and government, but economically into a highly, highly successful uh, uh, country, which uh, demonstrates the success of uh, free will, free enterprise, and self-determination. And it, it, uh, it represents a sharp paradox even today with what is going on in, uh, in North Korea. It's a little different in Vietnam where the uh, success of the communist movement did extend into the South Vietnam, but today uh, we're not aware so much of the uh, oppressive nature of the communist government in uh, Vietnam, whereas in Korea uh, the uh, the distinction is even sharper than it was in 1950 when the, when the uh, North Koreans sought to uh, spread their uh, econ economic goals and their political goals into South Korea. Was, was Truman still in office or did Eisenhower take over with the ending of the war? Uh, Truman was in office, but in 1953... I believe Eisenhower had uh, Eisenhower had uh, well I'm I'm going to have to recant a little bit on that because my memory is a little bit hazy. No, I think you're right. 
Uh, Eisenhower was in office then. I think he came in, yeah. And the reason I, I, re, I relate that it was that uh, uh, I came close to meeting Eisenhower when I was in Fort Knox, Kentucky, uh, just prior to being reassigned to Korea. So uh, now he, uh, he was considered to be a presidential candidate in, uh, in 1950, 51, and uh, when I got it, by the time I got to Korea, I think one of his campaign uh, issues was he wanted to see if he couldn't end the Korean War, and uh, uh, it, it the Korean War ended up as a stalemate. It, it's just unfortunate, but uh, the uh, we came we came very close to actually winning that war, and would have won it had the Chinese not entered the war. But the Chinese, uh, I I think. Uh, perhaps felt threatened, and uh, uh, that that of course re caused the uh, the conflict to revert back. And I guess we thought that we had a attained the the best uh, objective that we could, and uh, uh, but it's still the same situation as it was then, uh, until some resolution uh, occurs uh, as regards North Korea. I, think uh, we will continue in to the indefinite future just the way it is now. Um, as a, a veteran of three wars and an American citizen, over what does freedom mean to you? And tell me about the price for freedom. Well, freedom is something that people uh, discuss a lot. Uh, veterans uh, talk about it a lot. And... Uh, I think you have to experience freedom to really understand what it is. You also have to uh, be exposed to uh, uh, people who do not live under a system of freedom to uh, understand the contrast between uh, the freedoms that we enjoy in the United States as a democracy and those who live in a, uh, a totalitarian system where uh, the people do not have uh, a true uh, ability to select uh, their own government. Uh, communism uh, makes a sham out of uh, elections, uh, but we all know that uh, those elections are not free elections where self-determination comes into play. Uh, freedom uh, as embodied in our, in our Constitution is something that uh, people have a difficult time uh, relating to. We take it for granted in, the, in our country. Uh, and a lot of times uh, we, uh, we protest when we think some of our freedoms are, uh, are being infringed. But uh, uh, freedom is, uh, is that... Uh, sense that the individual feels that uh, that individual can and express himself freely, he can criticize his government. Uh, freedom with responsibility, I think, is the essence of, of democracy. Freedom is not unlimited to do anything that comes to mind because other people may be impacted negatively by the expression of certain of your freedoms. But uh, it's, uh, it's without a doubt the, the greatest uh, expression of, uh, of democracy that uh, the world has ever known. And we, we need to guard that freedom jealously. I agree. Tell me about the American flag. What does it mean and represent to you as a veteran? Well, the American flag has often been said to be, have a, a greater emotional impact on Americans than the flag of other nations have on the people of those other nations. And I think that is, that is true. Uh, exactly why it is, it is not clear to me. But um, perhaps it's because uh, our country uh, has been a democracy for over 200 years and the, the flag that we call our national emblem uh, has essentially been the basic same flag 
with modifications over the period of those 200 years, but the, the stars and stripes are still symbolic uh, of this flag. And uh, maybe unconsciously, it has been uh, inculcated in, into our education system because I think nothing epitomizes it more than the raising of the flag in Iwo Jima. And that particular act uh, is still one that's revered today. It involves the flag, uh, that the flag is symbolic of the United States of America as a democracy. And uh, veterans feel very strongly about it. Uh, that's exactly the reason that the desecration of the flag to a veteran is considered impermissible. And uh, that's why every veterans organization uh, strongly supports the notion of, 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 of a uh, constitutional amendment to, uh, to, to protect the flag from desecration, that we reject the notion that ex freedom of expression extends to the desecration of the flag. No other, no other nation in the world, I think, reveres its flag in quite the same way as we do. But the, the, the reason for it is, is not exactly clear to me, but I, I suspect it's because uh, that most Americans associate freedom with the flag. That's very well said, it's true. Have you been to the Korean War Memorial in D.C. or the World War II, Vietnam, all those memorials? I have been, yes, yes, and the, it's in a, proximity to the Vietnam Memorial, which is extremely uh, Im, uh, a, a moving um, memorial. And the, the, Korean, uh, the Korean Memorial is also uh, very, very well done. I'm going to go to, Viet, to the Vietnam Wall tomorrow. Sure. I've been there before, but do you know if there's parking around there? This is a quick question. There's Unfortunately, there isn't. Uh, yeah. uh, when I was there, uh, it's one of the downsides to, the, uh, to that area. Uh, and in, uh, in maybe maybe at this time of the year, uh, you can park on the street for a couple of hours, I think, and metered parking uh, in close proximity. Uh, other than that, probably uh, a, a, a parking facility nearby. But uh, you might be uh, fortunate enough to, you, you can, I believe you can park for two hours on the metered parking. And, and there, this is not the height of the tourist season, so you'd probably be all right. Um, obviously, I'm assuming you're proud that you're a veteran um, of World War II, Korea, and Vietnam. And do people thank you for that? Yes, they do. Uh, and, and sometimes the thanks come when you least expense, expect it. Uh, someone will uh, see uh, the Purple Heart license plate on my vehicle. And... Uh, if truck drivers, if you were in a parking lot or something like that, you're identified as a veteran, uh, that the thank you for your service is, uh, is a very, very moving expression on the part of someone. And uh, uh, it makes you proud to be a veteran. Uh, when uh, a, a veteran appears in uh, what we call the uniform of the veterans organization, they may be representing, and the Purple Heart organization is is the one I favor most. I'm a member of most veterans organizations, but the Military Order of the Purple Heart is a unique organization of just combat wounded veterans. And uh, when we go into schools to uh, present leadership medals, uh, it's an extremely rewarding experience each time you do it, uh, because Yes, we, uh, we are happy to uh, make people aware that freedom is not free. This has become kind of a trite expression, but it is true. Freedom is not free, and if we don't jealously guard our freedom, we could lose it. I'm going to ask you to do one more thing. At the end of the interview, I've asked all the veterans, over 300 of them now, but I'd like for you to give me a salute into the camera when I tell you to from where you're sitting. Sure, sure. Okay. 
you ever saw one of my films, you would understand why I, why I do this. So I did see some of it out in the lobby. <clears throat> yes, I did. It's extremely well done. Uh, did they have the audio on out there too, or just? Uh, I couldn't hear the audio. I think I was not listening to the audio. I, was, I think it was the D-Day landing. World War II, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, right. Okay, over right in the camera, go ahead. Great, thank you. Okay.